Welcome to the Consulting Success Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Zapersky. In this podcast, we'll dive deep into the world of elite consultants, where you'll learn the strategies, tactics, and mindset to grow a highly profitable and successful consulting business. Hey there, everyone. It's Michael Zapersky, and today I'm here with Nigel Green. Nigel, welcome. Thanks, Mike. It's a pleasure to be with you and uh, all your audience. So you're a a sales strategy advisor for B2B companies. Uh, You've played a major role in one company's growth from about $94 million valuation to over a $350 million valuation. You're also the CEO of StoryBrand, among many other organizations that you've worked and kind of played a, a big role in the sales kind of side there. But tell us, how did you get into the world of sales and strategy? So I started out as a sales rep out of college because it really was the only thing I was going to be good at. I didn't make good grades in school. Uh, In fact, there were only... There were eight people from my university that had a worse GPA than me. So I had to use my gab to put food on the table and money in my pocket. So I started out as uh, as a medical sales rep. Was not a great rep. But what I was, I was insatiably curious and I got exposed to a lot of managers, sales managers, most of them not very good. So I built a methodology and a framework for how to lead sales teams on what didn't work, wasn't going well. Thinking from the perspective of a sales person who represents the voice of the customer, who represents the market, how do we make them more comfortable? How do we make them secure? How do we give them the tools that they need? Because most sales managers don't think about it from that perspective. And so that lens by which I looked at building and leading sales teams was full of empathy. And I ended up leading well. And then the re- when you lead well, you can get really good salespeople to come work for you. And then they do all the work and then the rest is history. Right. Let's talk about fluctuations uh, because I think many organizations, you know, whether large or small, will kind of cater this conversation more to you know the independent consultant or the small consulting firm owner but they experience like the fluctuations the roller coaster the up and down right of revenue but there's also certain companies and people who don't find that they have much fluctuations in their business so i know this is something that you've spent time on that you you know kind of uniquely understand or you're very aware of what do you see as being the difference between companies and, and consultants who have these up and down fluctuations in their revenue and those that just tend to kind of coast along without too much fluctuation? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know one executive that I work with that would tell you they don't have fluctuations in their revenue. Okay. Now, if if you look back through a historical lens, you may see that the ebbs and flows are less volatile than some businesses. But I think the reason why those companies don't have a lot of fluctuation is because the leader is terribly scared of fluctuation. So they invest in contingency planning. They are always trying to put themselves out of business and they are finding new ways to make their revenue streams more durable, more rugged and more rigid. So, you know, like in the English language, the word fragile means that when you shake it, it breaks. We don't have a real good word for anti-fragile, the opposite of that. But the CEOs that I work with that have eliminate a lot of the volatility are looking for ways that when there is disruption, their business gets better. Right. And so for the independent consultant or the small consulting firm owner who wants to you know, generate kind of more stability in their business, in their revenues, in their pipeline, what are maybe some best practices or thoughts that you might offer that they should be looking at or considering to create more stability and move away from that volatility? I think that you want to eliminate no from a prospect's list of choices. And so for a lot of consulting firms, they don't give many choices on how to work with them. So no is a very reasonable choice for a prospect. And the more ways in which you can meet a potential customer where they are, and that can be through various mediums of delivering your insight or the way in which you add value, the more likely you're going to have a more durable income stream. Got it. So let me give you an example of that. So if the only way that you work with a firm is through monthly retainers or through one-year contracts or whatever it is that you think of as, as your general way of doing business, you will get disrupted at some point. You will get lazy on your sales and marketing engine or you will do so much work that you don't have time to go invest in sales marketing, and then a customer is going to change their mind about working with you. So the more ways that you can think of 
to create new creative, easier ways to do business with you and eliminate no, the less likely you are to be uh, exposed to volatility. So you're not suggesting that people launch a whole bunch of different offerings to the marketplace, which to me sounds like complexity, but rather figuring out, kind of continuing to focus on ways to create more leverage in what you're doing so that you're able to serve clients, you know, provide great value, but also make sure that it's really streamlined for you and kind of reduce complexity. Is that correct? Precisely that. Reduce complexity, eliminate barriers to entry, understand how to meet them where they are. Yeah. And what about for that independent consultant or small consulting firm owner that doesn't have a sales team yet? They don't even have a salesperson. You know, they, the founder, are the salesperson. They're kind of doing it all. What would you say to them? What do you think are some of the things they should be focused on if you had to kind of offer them a couple of you know, very tangible steps or just ideas or principles uh, that they could use to grow sales? Well, that's a great question. And I fall into that category. I don't have a sales team. I do all of my selling. I do all of my marketing. I save my best stuff for my business. And that's the nugget that I would give to any consultant listening to this. And what I mean by the best stuff is my best hours, my freshest time. When I'm thinking the most clearly, I spend that working on my business and not giving it away to the clients that are paying me. So talk, talk like more specifically, what does that look like? Do you, have you carved out specific hours every day or every week? Or how do you actually put that into practice? I don't engage with clients on Friday. Okay. Not at all. So when I wake up Friday morning, I am thinking about how can I put myself out of business? What's scaring me? I take action on well, I've got two clients. Say I have client concentration, which has been a very real thing. What happens if both of these clients leave? What am I going to do about it? So I start putting pen to paper. I start taking a coffee meeting or I save my best stuff for my business. I figure out how I'm going to eliminate the anxiety that comes with losing a big client or having too much concentration in, in one offering one client. And another piece of advice, I think I would stay lean. I mean, there's this whole movement of outsourcing your sales and hiring sales development and paying people to generate leads. They're buying you for a lot of your listeners. They don't want someone else to tell them what it is you're going to do for them. I don't know that there is a hack for getting eyeball to eyeball with prospects and asking questions that only you know how to ask, predicting what's going to be the next question, and then being real and accessible. Yeah. And that's a really good point. Um, I, I'm, I do the same thing for me. Both actually Monday and Friday tend to be more strategic days. They're days of working on the business as opposed to just working in the business. So I tend to do you know far fewer or no client calls on those days, just really working on the business. And it's so important, right? I say this to clients all the time. It's that time to work on your business. Like That's holy time. That's time that you need to have set in your calendar on a recurring basis so that you don't put anything else in there. And you know that's your time to work on it. So I'm, I'm glad that you shared that. And you know, we've seen it firsthand in our own business and in clients' businesses as well. What do you see, Nigel? Because you've been around a lot of different sales teams and a lot of people that are involved in sales. What are some of the most common mistakes that kind of pop up that you know, if fixed, would have a really big positive impact on the growth of those companies? So I think the problem that I primarily fix, Mike, is that the sales team's go-to-market strategy is fundamentally misaligned with how the business is trying to grow. So an example of that might be that the investors, the CEO wants to grow the business in the next year by expanding one offering in the marketplace. And yet the sales team incentive plan, the way they get paid, doesn't support that. And there's no one asking the question of, okay, how do we get everyone back in alignment with this? Or for instance, the business might be tasked with a certain earnings number, but yet you're allowing your sales reps to control the pricing and they're giving discounts and it doesn't hurt them if they eat away margin in the pricing. So I think that's probably the number one mistake that I see in my practice. And I think it probably happens to a lot of consultants in their business is that their business has moved and evolved and they haven't thought about the way they've structured their go-to-market strategy to support what it is that they're trying to do now. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a, a good point. And, and you're right. Like many people will start to do discounts or they'll provide services or take on clients that aren't optimal. And many times it's caused by short term thinking or just not a, a clear view on what future they actually want to create, you know, how they want their business to be, the lifestyle they want to have. And so just so focused on doing business, but not actually thinking strategically about what kind of business they want. 
Uh, so I think that's a, a really good point that you're sharing. What about, I mean, you mentioned your own company right now. So for your consulting practice, you're doing all the sales, right? You're doing that stuff. But what about the consultant that's growing and they want to bring on a salesperson? When would you say in your experience, Nigel, is the right time to think about adding a kind of a dedicated salesperson or sales function even to a small kind of professional services practice? So I think when you, the founder, the, the consultant has decided that you want to build an asset. So you are transitioning from freelancer to entrepreneur, or you want to build a business that works while you don't. That to me is a good leading indicator that it's time to invest in other people acquiring clients for you. Now, the trade-off is that for some period of time, you will be required to do more work to onboard them. But the long-term benefit is that if you do this right, if you manage their performance appropriately, it will create margin for you. It will create scale, but it's not without its own set of pains and challenges. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because that I think you know even if it's not sales, almost any type of role when you're building the team, there's always going to be that dip, right? That that point where you got to take a little bit of pain. You have to set the expectations that you're not going to get the results that you want in the short term, right? You got to get that training. You have to kind of cross that bridge, uh, and it's not going to always be easy. But once you do it and you do it properly, then the benefits that you're going to reap are are going to be you know well worthwhile, and you actually start seeing that ROI that you desire. So one thing that big companies do really well that I think uh, consultants should consider. When, when I listen to, when I've listened to some of your episodes and I listen to other consultants that talk about hiring their first sales rep, it often seems very binary. It's either I have to continue doing it or I hire a sales rep. Well, larger companies have gotten really good at renting sales teams. Mm. So the sales professional is not an employee. Most of the risk has been pushed off to another company, to another entity altogether. So in healthcare, a lot of companies will work with distribution reps or other ancillary offerings that already have the attention of the customer that you want and incent their sales team to sell what you have. Mm. And they get paid a higher commission so that it's worth their time. But if they don't sell anything, you don't have any sunk cost in an expensive sales rep that didn't produce. And you're kicking yourself six, seven months later. Interesting. Do you think that opportunity exists for people even you know, in different industries or even if you're a smaller player, let's just say an organization with five or 10 people, or is that just more an opportunity for, for an organization that is significantly you know, larger and more developed? I think the answer is all. Here's how you can ask if, it, if it's going to work for your consulting practice. Are there other businesses that have a sales team that has the attention not only of my customer, but of the decision maker within my customer's business, that my offering would be seen, not that just that it's not a conflict, but that they would be able to add more value to their customer by talking about what it is that I do. And if the answer is yes, you should pursue it. Right. So it's a complimentary offer uh, that gets you kind of into that ecosystem, into that, that distribution channel that would be maybe hard for you to achieve by yourself, but someone's already got that established. So you you could leverage and kind of you know connect with them and, and use the the momentum that they already have in the marketplace. Exactly. In a real, if, if someone's out there listening, they're scratching their head and saying, "What's the example?" Well, think about um, big SaaS companies that don't do the implementation of their software. They have third party implementers. That's a great way. And there's so many small to medium sized third party implementers that rely on big SaaS companies to keep them afloat. Well, you just take that same principle and apply it to whatever it is that you're offering to the marketplace. Yeah, a great idea. I saw on your website, one of your clients talked about how you kind of help them to win more business, to you know close more deals. I'm not a huge fan of the word close. It just sounds, I don't know, <laughs> at first they win more business or you know make something happen. But regardless, you know, you're helping them to win more deals. What do you see in, in organizations or, or with salespeople? Because even for the consultant listening to this, who's going into a lot of different sales conversations, feels like they're, they're having a good conversation, but they're just not able to get it across the line. What typically stands out to you or, or where do you as an expert in sales go to? What do you look at to try and identify what's really holding people back? What's kind of the roadblock in that conversation? While we work with a lot of seasoned and experienced consultants here at Consulting Success, I'm often contacted by new early stage consultants. 
Invariably, the question I'm asked is, what are the steps I should take to become a successful consultant and grow my consulting business to my first six figures per year? Well, I'm excited to announce that we've opened the doors for our Momentum program. This is our most popular program for early stage consultants, and it has helped almost 1,000 consultants to start, run, and grow successful consulting businesses. It gives you the step-by-step plan to help you with your messaging, your fees, and pricing strategies, how to win more proposals, how to go to market more effectively, developing a marketing system to generate leads consistently, and so much more. And right now, until September the 19th, you can sign up for Momentum and get 50% off the regular price by going to consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio. That's consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio, A-U-D-I-O. Only 100 spots are available to join Momentum and get 50% off. This deal is only available until September the 19th or until all 100 spots are gone. We won't be opening up new spots in this program for several months. So don't wait. Go to consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio. That's consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio. A-U-D-I-O. It's really simple. I ran the sales team for a clinical services company for a number of years and got exposed to a lot of really good doctors and clinicians. There's this growing momentum in the clinical community of a technique called motivational interviewing. It is by far and large used with a clinician and a patient. But the thesis of it is that any motivation that I, the clinician has, I, the doctor has for you, Mike, the patient to change is never going to be as strong as any motivation that might already exist in you to change. So motivational interviewing is about unlocking why you would do it. And I think that closing in today's marketplace has evolved to probing and uncovering why you would do it. Like I could sit here and tell you why other clients have worked with me. I can offer why I think that you might want to work with me. But if I can just understand why you might? Why did you take this meeting? What are you hoping to get out of this? And if I can keep you there versus trying to have to process some other reason that I've given you to do business with me that may, you may not be able to understand, I've got a better chance of adding value to you. You're really getting at the core as to you know, what their motivation is, what's going on inside of them. It's not about the external you know, kind of implications, although those are important as part of the conversation. But what's really driving it is you're going deep I kind of I share this with clients like the way I talk about it is peeling the layers back from the onion you're you're really trying to get at the core of what's driving them what's motivating them that's what you're saying Exactly so we ran addiction treatment centers for a long time we didn't have a lot of people that came to treatment because they had an addiction problem they had a, I'm going to lose my house problem my wife's going to leave me problem my job's going to be gone problem so we said well you know what you don't have a drinking problem but what if we could help you keep your house And so the translation is, they may not have, in my business, they may not have a problem with their sales team, but they've got a problem of our leaders not growing fast enough, or our competitor is is, is eating up this big piece of market share for, okay, well, let's fix that problem. And so you as the consultant, when you're going in, you have to think of what problem do they have as they perceive it. They're the experts on their problem, not us. And then would you suggest that people use that as kind of the the food or you know, the opportunity for their messaging, like should the, the motivations that the clients and the buyers have, should that be at the forefront of everyone's messaging in your experience? It should be so much in the forefront, Mike, that I recommend you state it back to them in a different way. When they say, you know, I really have a problem, our, we have a problem with our IT team and we can't seem to get the expenses under control. So you say, if I'm hearing you correctly, the expenses in your IT department have become a real problem for your business. And then you just, you just let, sit there. Yes. Would you like me to help you with that? Right. Yeah. I just told you I have a problem. Okay. Well, let me help you. So you say back to them what they've already told you. And what do you say to people who go, okay, Nigel, that makes sense. Like, sure, I'm going to focus on the problems that my ideal clients have, their motivations. But how do I understand and how do I identify what those motivations actually are? What's in your experience been the best way to actually hit on the true motivations that people are having if someone is new to the marketplace or maybe they've even been consulting for some time, but they don't have strong, compelling messaging. They've maybe got their business to where they are just on the back of referrals in their network. Like We see this a lot with clients coming to our coaching program. They've gone to a, even a good place, but it's just come from their network of referrals. And now they want to really start building out that marketing system. And so they're wondering what messaging should I actually use to resonate with my ideal clients. What's your experience with that? 
So uh, problems exist on an external level. So your customers will tell you, we'll stick with the same expensive IT department uh, example. Well, that's, that's how it exists. They're not going to take action. They're not going to do business with you because of that. They're going to do business with you because of a deeper level of the problem, an internal problem, the way it makes them feel, the way it's affecting their job performance, how it's affecting their identity, or an even deeper level, a philosophical problem. Why an expensive IT department is an injustice, why it's untenable for the business. So you use language like, you shouldn't have to deal with this, or you shouldn't, no business should be hamstrung by an expensive in-house IT department. There are cheaper solutions that are out there. Don't be limited by the insight that exists on your team. You have to understand what it is that about the problem that affects their identity and is an injustice to the business. And that's where the language is. That's where all the copy is. Yeah, got it. We don't fix IT problems. We fix IT problems because I want you to be a hero. I want you to get that promotion. I want you to be an executive. I want you to get your bonus because you saved a million dollars a year and out by outsourcing. It. Right. Yeah. Good points there. So Nigel, you've now been consulting, right, running your own consulting business for I think about four to five years. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. What have you seen? Like when you first started, how did you generate leads for your business and, and opportunities? And then what are you doing differently now, if anything, in terms of what's working best for you to generate leads for your business? So I solely started my practice on word of mouth referrals. And that, that was subsistent for a while. But I'm doing the advice that I uh, just shared with your team. I was anxious all the time. I was a roller coaster of where's this next? What if they leave? What am I going to do if this retainer falls off? And I'm creating more durability in my own income stream. And I've recognized that being expensive creates a barrier. An expensive consultant creates a barrier to folks that might one day want to work with you, but just can't afford you right now. So I'm creating some lower barriers to entry to work with me, like a, a course. I've got a book that's coming out in January. I'm just thinking through trying to optimize for effectiveness. And so is there, are you doing anything else in terms of actually right now generating leads and opportunities that it's working for you? I know you got your Friday, right? That's the time dedicated to working on the business. Are you writing? Are you putting out content? Are you calling on people? Are you going to events? Are you doing webinars? Like Anything like that that's working for you right now? Yeah. I've made a career of being a guest on other people's podcasts. You know, there's, I don't have my own. I go on others. I write long form. I found that my audience prefers a more meteor, insightful, longer form piece. So there are schools of thoughts that want you to write four or 500 word posts and frequency is important. That's not what my audience wants. So I think that the nugget there is understand, put yourself in the shoes of your ideal customer. Do they want to read something every day? No. My audience wants to hear from me once a month and they want it to be really relevant, timely, and deep. So I write. And like I said, I've got a book that's coming out in January. It's really a, uh, a synthesis of, of how I view the world of the sales manager. Uh, and I'm working on a course with uh, Mary Lou Tyler, who was the author of Predictable Revenue. So we're taking the predictable revenue concepts and overlaying it in being a, for the sales leader, how to be a predictable sales leader. Got it. Nigel, when you kind of think back over the last 12 months, what principle or, or idea have you learned and implemented whether it's in your business or even on the kind of the, the personal side that has made the biggest impact or, or kind of increased your performance to a higher level? Is there anything that stands out that you've you learned and adopted and, and implemented? Undoubtedly, it's the advice that David Baker talks about in his book, The Business of Expertise, of taking time to write out how I view certain principles. And it, it's not easy. It's not fun. But when you can get really clear on how you see a certain function of a business or really think through why you form certain opinions and principles, it's profoundly impactful in helping your clients understand what the solution is. Because you, you've got, you've roadmapped what it is that you've done. And it's really hard work. But I would challenge anyone to just sit with it and do the work. Yeah, we had David on the podcast a little while back and that was a great episode. And uh, yeah, he's got a great book. He's a good guy. So I highly recommend that. How about challenges? Like, so again, last 12 months, anything that has been a bit of a roadblock for you or something that you came up against that now looking back with hindsight, you know, you learned a good lesson has actually helped you to, to strengthen or improve your position or your performance? Yeah, I, um, 
remind myself of why I got into this business, right? I made the decision to stay an independent and not join another management team because I'm optimizing for happiness. I don't want to work 50, 60 hours a week, but I found myself doing things that I call it creating my own prison, but shackles, if you will, to being stuck into my consultancy and making me less maneuverable. And I said, Nigel, that's not the point. So I think the the nugget there is a lot of consultants listening to this got into this for freedom and they're finding out that what they're doing is building their own prison brick by brick. And I say, man, put the mortar down, undo that stuff and remind yourself that what you're really doing is getting time. That's why we're doing this. And time's more important than money. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. We see this a lot with clients who have shifted from the corporate world into consulting. And then oftentimes if they don't look up enough, they just end up kind of building, as you mentioned, I mean, I never call it a prison, but it's essentially just another job, right? But they're their own worst boss now and they're not, you know, they're working more, they're still feeling stressed. So really working with them to undo that and, and create a plan so that they can do what they want, which is Maybe it's traveling the world or more spending time with loved ones or, you know, buying a farm, whatever it might be. And uh, I know that's, that's your situation, right? We were talking before jumping on here, the, how you've done that. And I think that's wonderful because like 100%, right? It's the memories, it's the moments, it's all these things that it's not about money, right? It's about the things that you can really hold on to that are the most meaningful. So I'm fully with you on that. Yeah. Good stuff. So Nigel, I want to thank you again for coming on here today. And where's the best place for people to go to? I mean, just to learn more about your work? Is it, is it your website so they can read some of your articles and, and content? Let us know. I mean, what's uh, the best place for people to go to? Yeah, that's right. It's the website. It's findevergreen.com. So today we talked about uh, the, you know, the closing and I'm like you, I hate the word closing, but I wrote a long, it's 18 pages and it, got, it has role playing on how to overcome different objections from your clients. And actually we get in our own way and I point out eight responses that we're all guilty of using that stand in the way. So I think that's a good place for consultants to start is to kind of check what is my go-to response that is really not conducive to people working with me. I think that'd be a good place. Yeah. And I put out, uh, I put out long form content once a month and they can check it out there. Where can they find that? Cause I went, I was on your website before you have your article section, if they click on articles and then is there an easy way for them to find that piece or? Yeah. So if you go to the insights and then go to resources, it's there. Got it. So what, actually what we're going to do is, Afterwards, we're going to grab that link or we'll try and make sure it's in the show notes. If people can just go to the show notes, go to the consultingsuccess.com podcast page, just type in Nigel or Nigel Green and you'll find this episode. We'll have everything that we've kind of talked about here today listed in those show notes. And we'll try and have the link that goes directly to that article there because I think that'll be very valuable for everyone. So again, Nigel, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, thank you. And my promise to your audience is when you download this, you will not get a million emails from me because I hate that and I'm not going to do that to you. All right. Good stuff. Thanks again, Nigel. Talk soon. All right. Thanks. See you, Mike. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Consulting Success Podcast. For more episodes and to subscribe, rate, and leave a review, head on over to iTunes. And if you'd like to develop consistent lead flow and a highly profitable consulting business, learn more about our coaching programs at consultingsuccess.com.